Um, I refer in the book to this derogatory term that has, has that I would hear uh, mentioned for mental health staff in prisons. They would be they would be called hug thugs. Um, in other words, you're you're just here to comfort these quote unquote bad people. Um, and but that that tells you something about the precarious place they have in these institutions. They're not seen as legitimate. And and the, the you know the the other phrase I would hear is that is that the security personnel would do things to send a message to them that this is our house. We run it. We set the rules. You don't. Hi, I'm Naomi Murphy and this is the Locked Up Living podcast where we talk with a wide range of people about harsh aspects of institutional life. We also explore some of the ways to overcome them and to grow and develop. I'm David Jones. So join us every Wednesday morning, 6 o'clock UK time, for a fresh podcast. Al Press is a writer and journalist who contributes to The New Yorker, The New York Times and other publications. He's also a sociologist with a PhD from New York University which, along with his family background, goes some way to explaining his deep sensitivity. He was born in Israel and grew up in Buffalo, which served as a backdrop of his first book, Absolute Convictions. His second book, Beautiful Souls, examined the nature of moral courage through the stories of individuals who risked their careers and sometimes their lives, and doing this to defy unjust orders. His most recent book, Dirty Work, examines the morally troubling jobs that society tacitly condones and the hidden class of workers who do them. This is a recipient of the James Aronson Award for Social Justice Journalism and he's just received an Andrew Carnegie Fellowship a Coleman Centre Fellowship at the New York Public Library and a Puffin Foundation Fellowship at Type Media Centre. Ayal is also a podcaster himself and you can see the link in the show notes. We wanted to talk with Ayal because we've always intended in our podcast to consider the deep moral, social and psychological reasons of why terrible things happen and what underlies the decisions people make when in such situations. Isle's book, Dirty Work, argues that people are mainly pressured to do tasks which mostly the rest of us hold in disdain, while being complicit in their continuation. The book studies three areas, prison work in the USA, drone pilots in war situations, and workers in meat and poultry factories, Each of these are shocking and deserving of a conversation of their own. Today we shall mainly focus on prison work in the southern United States. Welcome, Isle, and thank you for joining us today. I'm very excited too. um, Great. Yeah, so welcome, Elle. So great to have you on here. I really enjoyed your book. And actually, not just the chapter on the chapters devoted to prisons, but also the many other areas that you touch on um, in, your, in your book. And I'd really recommend the book to all of our listeners. Um, I think it makes for great, great reading, although it is quite painful stuff to read. Um, but firstly, you were, you were born in Israel, and yet now you live in New York State. And I wondered if you could tell us about how you ended up there and why you ended up choosing sociology for your PhD and choose, choosing such a dark subject to focus on. Yeah. Um, so uh, I was less than three years old when my family moved from um, Israel to uh, Buffalo, New York. Um, and uh, I actually, Buffalo is the subject of the first book I wrote called absolute convictions. Um, and it's the story of, uh, my father, who is a, a, a medical doctor and an obstetric gynecologist, uh, accidentally stumbling into the most polarizing domestic issue in the United States, the abortion conflict, because he um, performed abortions at his practice, along with delivering babies and doing all the other things he assumed were um, the responsibility of an OB. 
um, and because of that ended up facing protesters and 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 there was considerable violence uh, including a shooting that took the life of a colleague of his um, uh, Barnett Slepian and um, just in that sort of brief description I, I think you can get a sense that I grew up with um, politics and social issues uh, kind of uh, you know really, uh, bubbling up all around me. Um, I can recall going out to the driveway to, um, I loved tennis. So I would take a tennis racket and tennis ball and just hit the, hit the ball against the wall for hours. And at a certain point, uh, there used, there were protesters there, um, protesting my father's medical practice. Um, and I think that, uh, I became a journalist because of a fascination with, um, with how people navigate difficult moral and political situations uh, and that has probably you know is related to my upbringing and also the fact that uh, I'm the son of a holocaust survivor so all around in the history of my family there are these issues of how to um, act in 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 dangerous circumstances that's really fascinating and I was just wondering what it was like for you as a child to witness that sort of protesting so I imagine it could be quite scary um to hear all of this it was scary um i didn't want to um i didn't understand it uh obviously um the only thing i knew about my father's career and business was was his profession was that uh he delivered babies um and we would get uh, bouquets and cards and i often would you know steal some of the yummy snacks that were in them from uh, with pictures of mothers holding their newborns um that's why he wasn't home at night because he went out to do a delivery and i i often rarely saw him um but uh I had no idea what abortion was. I had no idea why there was a controversy around it. I didn't know what evangelical Christians were. Um, I didn't know why the um, movement in America that opposes abortion um, had gone from being sort of, you know, a peaceful protest of people praying the rosary to um, mostly men um, accosting women who were entering my father's office and other places like it. Um, I had to learn all of that later, but I think that when you see and experience those things, um, they stay in your memory and you want to understand them. So I went back but to I guess it some people might have wanted to shy away from it because it sounds quite painful. So it's, it, so it's interesting that there's something in you where you wanted to seek that out and understand it rather than avoid it, because I, I think we might be quite split as popular as people. Well, I, I, I did want to avoid it until... I learned of the murder of Barnett Slepian, the doctor in Buffalo who my father knew. And that shifted everything for me. Um, that made me feel like I had an obligation to write about this, um, to write about how, you know, not to put it too archly, but how a movement that, that calls itself uh, pro-life and says it acts in the sancti in the name of life and the sanctity of life um, can get to a point where its most fervent members are bombing places and torching uh, medical clinics and shooting doctors. Um, so, and what, yeah. what did you uncover in, in, in that book, in the process of writing that book? Well, um, I think that that book, along with actually the book we're going to be discussing, Dirty Work, and my second book, Beautiful Souls, are all in a way about the same thing. Um, they're all about people in... Um, often dangerous, certainly morally challenging situations, trying to figure out how to act in a way that um, is true to their principles. And in some of my work, you know, people betray their principles and don't, don't do the courageous thing. Um, and I, th that's probably what's happening mostly in dirty work. In the first two books, the, most of the people I'm writing about are very principled people, but they pay an enormous price too. They, they, in physical safety, they may lose their jobs, their reputations. So I think there are risks both ways. Um, and I'm just generally interested in the subject of you know, risk and moral courage and, and, and how it shapes us. I wonder, um, I'll how 
you're just thinking about your role as a journalist, it seems increasingly that that's an area also that requires moral courage to to speak the truth, as if um, there's increasingly pressure to um, deliver one narrative, um, whether that be in politics or, or social issues. I think that's true. Um, you know, in the United States, we are so polarized as a society. Um, so there's red America and there's blue America, and they don't really speak to each other very much. Um, and I think it is increasingly difficult as a journalist to challenge um, the accepted truths within one's own side um, and not just to um, challenge the lies that proliferate increasingly and shape public discourse, um, which unfortunately is a problem I don't think is shrinking. I think it's growing. Um, so it's a twofold challenge. On the one hand, to just try to, um, you know, convey what you think is some semblance of reality in a world that's awash in conspiracy theories and fake news and so forth. Um, but then there's also the piece of it of bringing hard truths to maybe the people who agree with you on a lot of things. Um, and I think that that's a big part of how I see my job. I wouldn't want to do this if I weren't also doing that. Thank you. So, so in your book, Dirty Work, you explore dirty the dirty work of um, a number of different sectors and obviously our backgrounds are both in in working in prisons so certainly reading um your chapter your chapters on prison work uh, whilst i i don't think i've seen things as as bad as 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 some of the events that are depicted in your book it did resonate in a very unpleasant way i i, I found that bit of the book the hardest part to read actually but you were a journalist at the time how did you go about getting access and managing to get get the information that you needed to, to and get people you know get the confidence of people to tell you their stories really it's very difficult in the united states probably in all places but um certainly in the united states to report on what is going on in jails and prisons because they are closed institutions. Um, they they can let you in if you file the proper forms with a media outlet behind you. And I did get into uh, the prison in Florida. I was writing about the Dade Correctional Institution. But um, you, what you get is a trip through what, what I think of as the front door. Um, and when you go through the front door, you get a tour and the tour is curated and what you see is controlled and filtered. Um, there were some accidental things that happened along the way that were quite illuminating. I, I ran into uh, uh, one source in the book who had refused to speak to me, actually, when I when I called her. Um, but there she was. So, um, you know, th that can happen. But but I think that um, as much as you can absorb walking around a facility you can you can get a sense of the, the dimensions of it the, the noise level the um the physical space you know all of that um you're also not necessarily seeing what it looks like when you're not there and um as a reporter you just have to be conscious of that so um i tried to use um as my main sources people who had either been incarcerated in the institution or worked in the institution or worked in other Florida prisons um, and, and could tell me about what that was like. And what, what was your own visceral response to going into a prison? Um, it, was, it was eerie to go to the Dade Correctional Institution because, and I say this in the book, um, you know, it's in this remote secluded area and, and, and I think that's intentional. But the, the, the geographic design of America's jails and prisons is that they're meant to be not seen, um, to be kept out of the way. There's nothing really dramatic that you see. Um, it looks, you know, you see razor wire, you see fences, you see fields, you see buildings. Um, you don't see violence, um, you don't see fear, you don't see conflict, you don't see abuse, you don't see um, coercion. And yet I knew all those other things are, are there and were omnipresent in this facility. So 
uh, it was a little strange. Yeah, I think I can re really, um, th we were recently, we've arranged to interview somebody who, who's had to get um, Home, well, Ministry of Justice permission to be on the, on the podcast. But I think part of that comes with knowing that the interview will be what's palatable, what he's allowed to put across in conversation. But I think the other thing that I've noticed working as a, a health service employee in a prison was that actually some of the things that are just accepted, they, there's no, there's no self-consciousness about because it's just part of the culture. And actually that can be quite revealing in itself, which I guess is what you're, you're saying going in as a journalist that you can't, could kind of glean things from how things are, even if it wasn't what they were wanting to, to give you in their creative view. I should say that I say in the prison section of the book, I, 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 I interviewed a professor uh, in the United States, Michelle Deitch, who, who, who studies prisons comparatively. And one of her points was that prisons in the United States are much less regulated in terms of public oversight and community oversight than in a lot of other countries, uh, certainly advanced uh, industrial democracies and, and in Europe. So that's important for, for the audience to know that that they're more hidden to Americans than to to, to folks in in a lot of other places, um, and and I think that that is particularly troubling because America has the largest prison system in the world. This is a major enterprise. This is not, you know, an incidental to the social fabric in America. There are communities in the United States where everyone knows someone who has has spent time behind bars. Um, and, uh, and I think that even in the communities where that's not the case, we're all connected to those institutions, but we can talk about that later. And in, in the UK, there's um, an obligation to try and um, make the mental health service access for people in prison uh, reach the level that you'd expect within the community, but it's taking a very long time to achieve that. What, what's the access to mental health provision like in American prisons? Well, it's very interesting. On the one hand, you would you would call it um, progressive because um, you know Americans don't have a right to health care um, as as citizens. That that's that's a striking thing about the United States. But incarcerated people do have a right to health care. Um, uh, an institution cannot simply um, lock them up and, and deny them, you know, treatment for uh, disease or mental um, a health crisis. Um, I think everybody would recognize why that, you know, these people don't have agency to, to, to pursue those, those things on their own. So, of course, there is more of an obligation. But it's also striking that you see a lot of homeless people in New York City and other, this is a big issue right now in New York, uh, people who have no access to any kind of mental health care. Um, so uh, the Supreme Court has ruled that it, that prisoners, uh, incarcerated people do have a constitutional right to, um, to get care. Now, the problem is that, um, you know, if we had a relatively small prison system that was properly staffed with, um, you know, enough well-paid mental health experts and just, um, uh, you know, security personnel to kind of run things in, in, in a way that that care could be delivered, it would be one thing. What's happened in the United States and what my book really looks at is how jails and prisons have become the de facto mental health asylums in the United States. And in other words, institutions that are completely overrun with people with severe mental health problems who, who do not have the staff that are trained to um, in any way deal with um, their problems. And what ends up happening, the default mechanism for controlling uh, what goes on is force, um, not, not care, not treatment, but, but rather violence, the threat of violence, um, segregated units, um, and I think everybody kind of recognizes it only makes everything worse. <laughs> um, and yet it, it continues to go on. And that's about society's, you know, failure to really provide alternatives that are more humane. So while it's a constitutional requirement to provide 
health service, the presumably the the actual level of provision isn't stipulated in any way. Is that is that right? That is right. And um, what ends up happening is um, there there the 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 staff who work in the mental health units of jails and prisons um, are seen as in many of these institutions as kind of, kind of as intruders, you know, why are you here? Um, I refer in the book to this derogatory term that has, has, that I would hear uh, mentioned for mental health staff in prisons. They would be, they would be called hug thugs. Um, in other words, you're, you're just here to comfort these quote unquote bad people. Um, and, but that, that tells you something about the precarious place they have in these institutions. They're not seen as legitimate. And, and the, the, you know, the, the other phrase I would hear is that, is that the security personnel would do things to send a message to them that this is our house. We run it. We set the rules. You don't. Um, so there's not an established set of, of standards. There's also not uh, a culture, I think, that is in any way conducive to delivering humane care. It's interesting what you're talking about, because we were just a moment ago talking about something a bit similar. And it sounds to me as if in the US, things are drawn very starkly, but the same processes uh, seem to be repeated probably all over the world, certainly in the United Kingdom, where, for example, the term care bears is in fairly common currency. That's very interesting. Um, you know, I often think that the United States these days is just um, a sort of exaggerated version of, of the things you see elsewhere. Um, so, of course, there's there's homelessness everywhere. But there's more of it in the United States. Um, there's police brutality everywhere, but there's more of it in the United States. There's inequality everywhere, but there's more of it in the United States. And that's sort of how I've come to, to think of it. Yeah, thanks very much. You, you describe um, some of the people you talked with in, in, in very warm terms, actually, some of the uh, healthcare assistants and some of the counselors. Uh, and one of them, in particular, Harriet, you mention quite a lot. And she has some very challenging uh, experiences. Could you tell us something about those? Sure. So Harriet uh, Kraskovsky, uh, who's really the main mental health uh, professional I write about, started working at Dade Correctional Institution. She had never worked in a prison before. Um, she was scared when she went in. She honestly thought of it in very black and white terms. The guards were the good guys who would protect her. And the, the incarcerated folks were the dangerous ones who might hurt her. Um, as she started working there, her attitudes underwent a shift. She felt um, increasingly that um, the people she was entrusted to care for first of all, were, um, you know, they were human. They were, she saw the humanity in them. She, she connected very deeply with some of them, not all, but, but with some of them. Um, and she was appalled at the mistreatment that they were forced to endure. And that was a slow awakening. It began with things like, you know, why are, you know, it's called this, the unit was called, what was supposed to be, um, uh, a, a place where um, people with mental health issues went to receive treatment and, and rehabilitation of some kind. But what she would see is guys just sitting alone in rooms and getting worse, getting sicker and sicker. And that just troubled her. Um, then she started hearing from some of them that they weren't being given meals during mealtime. Their trays would come and they would open them and they would be empty. There'd be nothing on them. And she, she eventually raised this with her supervisor and her supervisor gave her a very telling response. Uh, first, she said, you know, you can't trust what they say. And secondly, um, by the way, our job is to get along with security. In other words, don't say anything, even if, even if they're not getting fed. It's not your job to, to, to raise a fuss about it. Um, well, 
Harriet did raise a fuss uh, subsequently about something else that was happening, which was um, a group of, of guys who were never being let out into the wreck yard at the facility. And this was their only daylight, the only time they got out of their cells. And um, when she complained about it, she got retaliation. And the retaliation came in the form of doors not opening for her, security doors not opening for her, or on several occasions, her being left alone. You know, usually there's supposed to be a security uh, guard watching the group sessions she would oversee. And suddenly she'd look up and the, and the guard was gone. And that was a message to her. You know, we don't have your back. If you, if you raise a fuss, we don't have your back. We will not protect you. Um, on one occasion, actually, she was nearly assaulted in the wreck yard when she was left alone. And so uh, the message there was that, that phrase I used earlier, this is our house. You know, we run this place, you don't. Yes, so there's quite a lot about Harriet in the book. How did it turn out for her in the end? Well, um, the dramatic, I don't want to get get too graphic uh but but what what harriet discovers uh subsequently is that one of the um prisoners uh an inmate named daryl rainey um uh dies in 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 a shower at the prison um and she raises questions about it and the nurses tell her uh she discovers that this was by design that um some of the guards had you were using a shower basically to torture um, some of the, the mentally ill prisoners they didn't like uh, by locking them in there and, and they controlled the flow and the temperature of the water and the water was scalding and um, Rainey was locked in that shower and he collapsed in it and, and he died. And when Harriet discovered that um, she was so horrified and it was this sort of moment where she realized that those assumptions she'd made about the good guys and the bad guys, it all just turned gray. Um, and she wanted to report it, she, like any uh, responsible professional would. Um, but she'd already been sent this message that if you cross us, we'll get you. Um, so she didn't report it. She silenced herself. And that came at a cost. Um, the... Uh, she started um, feeling depressed. She lost her appetite. She couldn't eat when she was working. Um, as I say in the book, her hair fell out. Um, and, and she would subsequently realize this was a trauma uh, response. This was her, her sort of, um, you know, having to not do what she felt she was professionally obligated to do um, caused her to experience what I describe as a kind of moral injury where a person is forced to do things that transgress their own values um, and then suffers a kind of wound to the spirit. Um, and that's what she underwent uh, when she was at Dade. Um, on the other hand, she, she also um, became, uh, I would say she grew a lot in this experience. It redoubled her commitment to helping people who are vulnerable, including the people she was treating at Dade. Thank you. So we've talked about prison staff and how they perpetrated, by the sounds of it, terrible acts. What, what do you make of, of them? What do you, how do you understand their motivation? How, and and how, do they, how do you think they were affected by being involved in these terrible acts? I, I think very badly um, on, on the whole. I, I, I think that, um, you know, dirty work is, the, 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 the book is about sort of two sets of victims, um, the prison section as much as the other sections in the book. The, the primary victims are the um, incarcerated people in this unit who are being subjected to these awful uh, abuses that, that I've just described. Um, but I also think that the staff of the prison are, vic are victims of this system um, because they, um, 
they have agency. They 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 they, it, they are not absolved of responsibility for 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 doing awful things. Uh, but not all of them did awful things. Some of them were trying to do their best, and yet they too um, got sucked into the system. And the book very much argues against foisting the responsibility for the terrible things that are going on on individuals, um, on individual employees, especially low ranking employees, because they are the ones who tend to get blamed. Um, and that's the way the institution and that's the way the society uh, sort of deals with the problem. They say, oh, well, we had a few abusive guards here, uh, but we fired them. So the problem is solved. Well, the problem's not solved because you still have a society that is using jails and prisons to warehouse um, people with mental illnesses. You still have an under-resourced facility. You still have guards getting paid way too little who have no training in how to deal with this population. Um, so, you know, I'm, I try to suggest that the workforce is um, that they too are prisoners of this system. There's a chapter called The Other Prisoners, and, I, and I'm referring to the staff there. Yeah, you do you do, do that very well. And I think, you know, that is something that we see repeatedly, don't we? Ex certainly in Britain, there's, you know, repeated exposés of hospitals where there's been brutal brutality, but it does tend to be the individual nurses or um, or nursing assistants that are the people that end up in court. It's very, well, I don't know if you ever see kind of like senior um, board members, for instance, who oversee these kind of cultures taking responsibility, which just feels very wrong. Yeah, in, in Florida, they, they fired a couple of guards. But as I say in the book, uh, the people in higher positions got promotions. Um, nobody uh, suffered repercussions. By the way, the, the governor of Florida at the, Scott, at the time um, is now a senator. Um, governor Scott became Senator Scott. Um, and, um, you know, so there was no accountability for those at the top. But even more so, um, I propose in the book that that these guards, if you, if you do want to blame the guards, that's fine, but you should see them for what they are. And what they are are agents of society. Um, these are public employees um, who were put in these positions by a society that, um, you know, has used prisons to, um, you know, effectively disappear large numbers of, of, people with severe mental illnesses. And so what, what do you expect that, that those workers are going to do and encounter and see? Um, in New York City right now, there's an enormous debate and, and, and public debate and, and a lot of anguish about uh, a mentally ill man who was um, choke, put in a chokehold and, and, and killed um, on a subway car. And um, it's on the front page of the New York Times today um, and it's raised this very painful issue of, you know, anyone who's ridden a subway car in New York has seen uh, a mentally ill person, usually without services, maybe felt afraid. Um, but also, um, you know, I think as a society um, has a certain awareness that, well, those folks are sleeping on subway cars because they're not in hospitals. They're not in community centers. They're not getting treatment. And that's a collective failure. Um, and prisons are the place where, where I think those kinds of t violent occurrences take place most frequently. So one of your consistent themes, uh, hey, others, that we're all complicit in this. We're all responsible in some way. And this came home very powerfully to me when I was reading the chapter about meat factories and uh, food. And I realized you were describing me, somebody who buys expensive meat, good quality meat, uh, believes that they're nicely looked after and meadow fed. Um, and there I was on the page. It really changed my view about eating meat. Well, um, I'm also writing about myself. I'm also writing about most of the people I know because, um, you know, I think that what to me is most striking about the meat system and the, the food system in the United States is the invisibility of the conditions under which the meat is processed and, um, 
you know, turned into something that's sold and, and consumed. Um, and increasingly, consumers do care about things like, you know, were dangerous antibiotics used or, or chemicals uh, that, that might affect their own health or about the treatment of the animals, you know, was, were, were they in a meadow, was, was this humanely raised, is, is, the, is the term here. Those labels almost never tell you anything about the experiences of the workers in um, the, 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 the meat processing plants in the United States. And as I try to show in the book, um, it is not lost on those workers that um, consumers often care more about the treatment of the animals than about their treatment. Um, and, and you have, you know, just staggering levels of both physical injury in these plants, but also, I would say, a, a kind of um, just degradation, uh, you know, that they are, as, as they put it to me, um, you know, they're treated like machines. And the minute they break down, if someone has a shoulder injury or repetitive strain injury, well, they're just discarded because there's someone else who will be brought in to do that job. Um, and many of these workers are immigrants. Many of them are undocumented. Um, this is not an accident. The, the industry recruits from that sector. And so um, it is a system of exploitation uh, behind the food system in the United States. I was just going to, I was conscious of the time, um, AL, and I was just thinking there's so many um, sectors that you cover in such such a deep way um but all of it with very much a focus on on how unsavory some parts of our society is and i just wonder looking into all these very murky places how do you look after yourself and keep emotionally healthy um thank you for the question uh and it's one by the way my my wife is a psychotherapist and some of her colleagues actually asked me that question as I was, as I was working on the book, I'm not sure I dealt with it properly. Um, you know, I think that probably it was, um, it did leave a residue. Um, and, um, you know, I saw and heard things that, that were deeply disturbing that maybe I haven't, you know, because as a, as a reporter, as a writer, you, you sort of remove yourself a little bit because you focus on the job and my job was to tell the story, to tell the wider world about these things. But I think in doing that, you can often skip over how it affects you personally. Uh, having said that, I will say that um, for people who are curious about dirty work, and, and we've talked a lot about some of the dark themes of the book, but to me, there's also a lot of light in the book. I, I don't just mean light, like not heavy. I mean light, like the sunshine um, and, and things that um, are frankly um, uplifting and inspiring because the workers I write about um, are people of great dignity um, who try more often than not to do their best in situations that are extremely challenging, if not impossible to navigate. And um, Harriet is a great example of someone who, um, you know, I think is a model in many ways of, of, you know, what a, the resilience of the human spirit. She is today um, working, um, doing very well and working, helping uh, young children who um, have been exposed to trauma um, and uh, doing, I think, very meaningful work, at least the last time we were in touch. That's what she told me. And, in some ways, I even think that the as horrible as her experiences at the prison were, I think they are a motivation and an inspiration for her to not give up and to not write people off and to not put people into categories of good and bad and like she, like she did when she first worked at Dade. She um, spoke about one uh, inmate in particular um, who she became very close to. Now, this man had been convicted of murder and at, at a young age, um, had been in prison for over 30 years by the time she met him, but had clearly undergone a profound transformation 
and was thoughtful and sensitive and cared about uh, the other inmates, the other prisoners in the facility, and um, actually wrote a letter to a watchdog organization um, about Darren Rainey's case in which he reflected so powerfully on the case. And he said, you know, no one at at that time, no one had been held accountable for it. And he said, you know, what this leads me to conclude is that, um, you know, some people are punished for murder uh, and given life sentences, but others get away with it, you know, when they have power, when they are in positions of authority. And really, who could blame him for concluding that? Um, and, and I think that for Harriet, she remembers this and, um, you know, takes it to a good place, takes it to wanting to make things better for people. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed, Hale. A real pleasure to meet you and hear about your experiences. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Really appreciate it. Thanks very much.